Hello everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Uh, this is going to close out module two, believe it or not, and we're halfway through the course, believe it or not. So there's that, <laughs> if you will. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, job performance with feedback uh, and, and how to improve job performance using feedback. And we're going to define the nature of feedback. We're going to talk about the characteristics of the recipient, the nature of the feedback, what works, what doesn't. And we're going to eventually come to an assignment where you're going to develop a feedback system. So uh, let's just get started on it then. In, in, improving individual job performance is a continuous process. And as uh, you're aware, I mean, I've made it pretty clear that I'm a freaking Deming disciple. And... Deming is about continuous improvement, and the only way really to demonstrate continuous improvement in any kind of objective fashion is through system of measurement. So we measure whatever aspect of a process, a system it is. It can be individual performance, it can be system performance, but, but we measure and then we design some kind of intervention, some kind of improvement to the process, and then we measure again to see if there was a st statistically reliable difference uh, in the improvement of the process. It really is that simple, and, and I don't understand why organizations have a tough time with this. Maybe they want to obfuscate, maybe, maybe they want to hide, maybe they don't want to be honest, but measurement numbers are honest, and, and to demonstrate performance uh, improvements via objective measures is the way to go. But we're going to put a twist on it because we're going to humanize it as well. That is to be really tight with the participant. That is the person with whom we're setting the goals. So let us then just look at the improving the individual job performance, the continuous process. We have the, the situational factors. And when you look at a chart like this, you say, oh, my God, that's, that's too much. You know, but... As an empiricist, as someone who likes empirical research, someone who likes to design interventions and or experiments and then measure the results, note that each one of these is the basis for some kind of improvement or change. So personal traits, this is something that systemically we would typically hire for. We determine what traits are a good match to a position, and then we continuously improve our hiring system to ensure that we're getting closer and closer to the trait pro profile as we hire. And, and that's what personnel psychology is about in, in large parts. So you might want to take that in the spring if that interests you. So we test for abilities and skills. So we know what abilities and skills are necessary to do the job well through job analysis. And then we hire people who possess those abilities and skills or those who have the potential to be trained in those abilities and skills. So job knowledge, well, job knowledge is one of the easiest ones. I remember when I was going to become the tech rep at the paper mill, uh, my boss's immediate subordinate, Clay, sat me down in his office when I first got there to the Wallula mill. He pushed himself back in his chair. He was a, he was a dumbass. You know, he was second in charge. He was never going to be any more than that. And he said, well, you know, Chuck said that you've got what it takes to do this job. Chuck was the tech rep who I was going to replace once he retired. And, and he said, you know, he says, you've got the, the unteachables. You're, you're good with people. You'll be good with the customers. You're, you're kind of a natural at that. And, and he said that you, but you're raw as hell as far as paper making knowledge and he says but we can teach that and, and it's true I can learn what I need to learn about the paper making business but there are some aspects of personality that are probably more difficult to learn I happen to be an extrovert and, and that would be important to this position right to be extroverted uh, I happen to be a high self monitor so I'm a very adaptable to situations so th those are qualities that kind of just are me and, and I become a good fit for that particular position right the other things, the knowledge is often things that we can train. And, and, and motivation, um, that's a whole other issue. We're going to look at motivation, I think, more in a future lecture. And if you're really interested in how motivation uh, kind of plays out in this, you could take psychomotivation in the spring, too. I know, another unsolicited advertisement. Now, the org, the team, the work group, right? We can look at culture and modifications to culture. You've had an assignment about that. We can look at job design and, and designing a job in, in a way that it uh, expand someone's potential uh, might be a good way to go and might be motivating for some of us. The quality of supervision, we must, of course, ensure that our supervisors are getting training as well in being supervisors. Right? And again, uh, 
personnel psych, we talk a lot about supervision, and, and, and the problem is that many people are promoted because they've been around a long time into supervisory positions, but it doesn't mean that they'd be good supervisors. It just means they've been around a good long time. I may teach okay, but that doesn't mean that I'm qualified to supervise teachers, if you get my drift. It's a whole different skill set that, than necessarily than teaching. Might possess it, might not. Not the issue. Now, the improvement process that we're going to talk about, and you're going to kind of work through in your assignment as well, is the goal setting, the central central part, uh, the feedback and coaching, and then the rewards and reinforcement. Now, I've left rewards and reinforcement largely to a, a lecture further down the road, kind of split it off of this one. What are the desired outcomes? Why are we bothering at all, right? Uh, as my stepdaughter used to say, why should I give a care? Right? <laughs> you should give a care because when you're operating an organization, you'd like people to persist, to show persistent effort, right? You'd like people to learn and, and become better, more expert at their jobs every day that goes by. People who experience personal growth, right, that, that, that's foundational. I mean, if you're the kind of leader that designs an organization, organizational policies, organizational systems that allow people to experience personal growth, Maslow is going to pat you on the back, right? Because self-actualization, according to the humanists and, and positive psychologists, is what it's about. So uh, there's a lot more to, to being a boss, necessarily, a leader, right, than pushing around numbers and the bottom line. It's a about developing people. So we have improved job performance as a result of this. If you can imagine yourself in an organization in a position that, that makes these things important, right? it's a natural that you're going to gain increased satisfaction and your job performance is, is going to improve as a result. And those two things usually go hand in hand. So one thing that we can take away is never compromise on hiring, that is, we've got to put our energy and we've got to put our best foot forward when it comes to hiring people. I'm sure most of you know what it's like to be clicking along in your workplace. They hire someone new, and, and it just makes life for everyone in the organization hell. Uh, hiring, I, I, well, of course, I teach personnel psych, so what, what, what else can I say about hiring other than I believe it's crucial to the business? Right? Nothing demotivates people like unequal treatment I mean, equal treatment of perceived unequals. So when they hire someone that's not qualified, is inferior in their performance, doesn't give a shit, isn't motivated, cheats on the company, be it time, theft, whatever, and then you have to continue to do your job for the same pay that they're getting, right? Nothing demotivates and, and nothing causes people to leave uh, as quickly. Now, training becomes all important as well. So hiring people or teaching people to train becomes critical. Uh, and in, in the paper mill, we spent a lot of time training trainers, identifying trainers through the use of process improvement teams, potential trainers, and then giving them the training they need to become good trainers so that we can always magnify our results. We can push our results out to other people. So goal setting, and we're just moving through that chart if, if you kind of got the drift here. Central to the import, uh, improvement cycle is goal setting. What are we trying to improve and what will improvement look like within that domain? Line of sight is a popular term and, and what that means is <laughs> just what it means, line of sight. I should be able to see achieving the goal. I should know what the goal is. I should know my role in achieving the goal and I should be able to see the goal and I keep my focus on that goal right? as I approach it. So people will know their part. And this is where the cool thing is that we start involving people in the goal setting process. We don't set goals for people. We negotiate goals with our people, right? And then we give them the resources they need, whether it's training, whether it's equipment, whatever it is they need to help accomplish their goals. But goal setting is a participative process. It's not a process that's thrust down on people. Right? So the learning goal. Well, through this, we hope to see enhanced creativity, knowledge, and skills. And that's the bonus for the company, the department, and it's the bonus for the individuals as well. So the goal setting process, well, a flow chart doesn't hurt. That is, if we have a flow chart of a process, then it allows us to look at the different steps of the process, and it allows us to know what measurements might be possible within the process to demonstrate the improvement. So good measurements, 
good input from the people who are involved in the process. And again, flowcharting on the one hand is a very technical exercise. But flowcharting on the other hand is a highly developed interpersonal melding, right? Because people have to work together and they come to understand and they share when it's all said and done a common vision of how the process operates or how it might operate in an improved fashion, right? So we can promote goal uh, commitment, right, Penelope? How do we do that? Well, we explain stuff, right? So I don't want Penelope to attack Lucy anymore. I don't want Annika to attack Lucy anymore. I don't want Electron to attack Lucy anymore. They're at this one year old and they're little buttheads, right? And so you, you do you understand the goal? We're not going to attack Lucy anymore. And what's our measure? We're not going to hear squalling. We're not going to see fighting and all this other nasty nonsense, right, sweetie? So what do you think of that? Notice, I've explained to uh, Penelope. So that was the explanatory rationale for not fighting. Uh, Lucy doesn't enjoy it. That's another reason. So training and resources, what do we do? Well, we keep on them. Right? And any time I see the aggressive posture or whatever, I try to stop it, nip it in the bud, right? In case you're uh, an Andy Griff show fan, Barney Fife, nip it. Nip it in the bud, right? So training and resources, encouragement and incentives. So you're doing a good job. You haven't attacked Lucy since last night. Good job. Rock on. Notice feedback is specific too. I'm not saying, oh, you're a good girl. I'm saying you haven't attacked Lucy, right? And we provide support and feedback. So we try to support her in her effort, make her feel loved, and at the same time, feedback on good performance or bad performance. So SMART goals, what are they? SMART goals are specific. Right? So it's an example of a specific goal. We would like to reduce turnaround time within this department on customer complaints. We would like to reduce the turn, turnaround time on average by 10%. Notice it's specific. It's quantifiable. Can we track the time on complaint turnaround? Sure, we can. And after we design the intervention, we massage the system or whatever, do we notice that we've achieved our goal of reducing it by 10%, right? So SMART goals specific. They're measurable. We've already handled the measurable, whether it's quality, quantity, relationships, consequences. All of those are measurable outcomes. Those of us who are psychology majors actually probably have an advantage because in psychology, especially organizational psychology, social psychology, we become really good at measuring things that don't necessarily appear to be measurable in the first place. Who would ever think that you could measure self-esteem? Who would ever think that you could measure the motivation to control one's display of prejudice, right? So we take away with us, right, in general, all of us from our university experience, a lot of information about how to operationalize constructs such that we can measure them. Yes, that's the fancy language, and you should be damn comfortable with that language by now. Right? Most of you are third, fourth years, right? So the goals should be attainable. They've got to be realistic. They've got to be challenging, though, because if they're slam dunks, then, then there's why am I bothering, right? It's already said and done. Uh, it's got to be challenging. It's got to be attainable, and it's got to be something that people want. It's got to be something that the organization wants. It's also got to be something the employee wants. Uh, if we're thrusting goals down on people and they're not negotiated, it may not be something that the people want in the first place, and they're probably not going to perform well in moving towards that goal. So we use result-oriented language, action plans using precise and ang uh, active language, right? So we'll be able to perform at a faster rate, right? perform at faster rates. So we use a lot of verbs in our goal statements. And goals should be time bound. And that's the T of SMART. You guys already picked up on that. So the T in SMART is there's got to be some kind of deadline on it. We have to have some kind of boundaries. Now, should the deadline be negotiable? Perhaps. Perhaps. And when we get to that deadline, we can look at the measures we have. We can say, how, we've, how are we doing? Did we reduce customer complaint turnaround time by 10%? And we say, well, we wanted to do that over a six-month period, and we've got it down to 8%. What should we do? 
And then the negotiation takes place. Well, I think we should devote another two months to it and see if we can get it down to 10%. Or I think that 8% at this point in time is, is good enough, that, that we need to, in fact, move on. We have other things that we should probably be looking at as well, and we, we can't do everything at once. So, but it's, it's a conversation, and that's really a take-home point is goal setting should be a conversation. So... Bolstering the job performance cycle of feedback, rewards, reinforcement. We're going to talk more about re rewards and reinforcement, but let's just fit it into the model here. So we have people with a certain level of ability, and this ability comes from training. It comes from the people we hired uh, who demonstrate this ability, uh, and, and then we have effort. And, and ability and effort can join, right, to develop our results. And, and the results are learning, personal development, and probably of, of the greatest interest to the hard-nosed among us is stable, strong job performance and continuous improvement. Now, one way to achieve this is to develop timely and instructive feedback. Feedback has to be given with enough time that it does some good. If you give me feedback on something I did three months ago and I'm not doing it any longer, I, I will just say, okay, that, that's really cool, thank you, but it's not really useful, right? So timely feedback is something that's built into the feedback system. When will feedback be delivered during this process improvement? expeditions, so to speak. Now, timely instructive feedback then, and you can see the direction of the arrows, not so well here, but we have bi-directional arrows going to ability and effort. So, not only does instructive feedback increase one's ability, that is, improve one's skills in that regard, it can also bolster one's effort that what I'm doing has meaning and I'm showing progress and the objective feedback indicates that, right? And then properly re uh, administered rewards and punishment, like I said, we'll talk about later and that has uh, the, the ability to enhance both results and effort. But rewards and positive reinforcement don't really feed to ability. So we have to use the instructive feedback hopefully objective, numerically based, right, so that we can show people they're doing better. And what's the fancy-ass term for that in, in, in psychology? The belief that I can do it, the demonstration of ability and increasing ability. Remember the little engine that could? Do you want your employees to be the little engine that could? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I know I can. We build self-efficacy through this process. That is the acknowledgement of one's ever-increasing abilities on the job. So feedback, ideally it's objective information about the individual or it can be about collective importance, uh, performance. And don't do it like, you know, my boss at the lumber mill, uh, good old Woods, I remember the feedback we got that one time. He came out here, and I, I told you guys this before, and I had to look it up when he says, you guys have been sucking hind tit all week. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And But pig ranchers do, and the runt of the litter gets <laughs> no teat on the sow so they can't nurse, right? Uh, so, that, But that's not objective. Tell, tell us what it is that's actually happening. Now, it can go the positive way, too. I have a supervisor at Ohio State who was telling me, Mark, you are awesome. You're doing an awesome job, you know. And, and at one point I said, you know, I love hearing that. There's nothing wrong with hearing the word awesome when it pertains to <laughs> the evaluation of oneself. But would you mind being more specific? Right now, what are we talking about? Right now, what aspect of my performance are you labeling awesome, right? Because that's going to give me better information. If, if I'm awesome in the, in the way that I deal with students, right, and communicate with students, that's cool, right? I, I can work to enhance that. But also what I'm not awesome at then presents me with opportunities to make meaningful improvement as well. And maybe my organization, my course organization, isn't as awesome as it could be, right? So specific feedback gives me things to actually notice and work on, right? Rather than just kind of that, good job. Yes, thank you. I thought it was a good job too. But what, boss, do you think was good about the job? 
And believe me, you tell me I did a good job, that's fine. Tell me the aspects of what I did well, but also then we can start discussing more easily and more readily the aspects that provide the biggest bang for the buck in the improvement cycle. So we can give instructional feedback and it clarifies the roles or teaches new behavior. So when I was working with Chuck and I'm meeting all our customers and et cetera, you know, that was the whole thing was interacting with people. He said, he would say things like, you know, watch how I'm going to ask them questions about the problem that they're having with our paper to get at the root cause, right? And, and, and then he would demonstrate to me and then the next customer we would go visit, he said, okay, so I want you to do it this time. And then he would give me precise feedback on the questions I used, how they worked well or how they might be improved upon, right? Motivational serves as reward or promise of reward. So, you know, great job. If we keep this up, I think there's going to be a 10% bonus for everyone at the end of the year, right? That is, if we keep increasing the sales at 5% a month, I don't see why we can't give a 10% bonus at the end of the year. Numbers always make it better, even if it's motivational feedback. Notice, motivational, you can be a little looser and, and, and get away with a good job, maybe. And then subjective feedback, and this is the thing, subjective feedback is easily contaminated by situational factors because it's ambiguous. And we know in situations of ambi ambiguity, then we are able to project all kinds of hidden, non-conscious kind of uh, reactions, responses, evaluations, attitudes onto the feedback process. So the more objective we make it, the less it will be contaminate and contaminated by situational factors. I think that we should then uh, call this part one and, and move on to part two.